Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Earth Show, the environmental show on USA Global TV and radio. My name is Roland Friedel, and as you can hear from my accent, I'm not a Native American or British English speaker. I'm raised, born and raised in a little small country in the middle of Europe in Austria. Uh, but since the early years, I always was traveling, meaning not spending vacation hotel on a pool or a buffet. No, I was always traveling. I was always eager to learn from other cultures, uh, languages, religions, nature. And during all these trips around the globe, uh, uh, privately or on business, I saw the pollution on the earth and what's going on and that we have to do something. And as I always say, as I respect my mother who gave birth to me, uh, I respect also uh, Panchamama, like the indigenous said, or Body Mama, like my my Indian background is. Uh, we respect Mother Earth, and that's why this Earth show is. And it's not a show that we are finger pointing; it's a show about how what we can do, uh, what we can contribute on a daily basis, every single day. And I'm, I'm not doing the show alone. Um, I am have an amazing co-host, my dear friend Marcin Krasiewski from Poland. He has a biological uh, background, and we do this show together. Uh, we work on the concepts together and bring guests on together. I know that right now he's joining us from his car. He's on the road. He just finished with a client. He's on the road. So hopefully we get him soon here. I can see a dark screen. Not wrong. Maybe it's coming soon, uh, Marcin. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if you uh, can hear me. I can. We can hear you, Marcin, but we don't see you on the screen. But maybe oh. maybe we can see a little. Okay. We can hear uh, you, but I not hope see so. you. Yeah. All okay. right. Thank you. Okay. Good, yeah, and as I said, uh, we have we, we do the show every two weeks. We have different we bring different topics on the show. Actually, two weeks ago, we have been talking to Amaya Rodriguez. She's the founder, together with her brother and CEO of the Gravity Wave, an amazing Spanish company who has thousands of fishermen under contract in the Mediterranean Sea who fish out from the deep ground of the Mediterranean Sea all the plastics, specifically uh, the fishing nets. Uh, recycle it, they shred it, and they make durable products out of it. And yeah, Marcin, uh, hopefully we get your picture soon. And today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, I'm very looking forward to that. I'm a little excited, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not very often excited, but it's not really excited for me. For me, he's an absolute hero. And what I absolutely love on this person, he has a spine, a backbone that is on sale. He when he has he has a vision and when he's on a mission, he doesn't care what's going to happen, who is threatening him, what's on the way. He is on a mission for his whales. And I want to start with an intro. I'm a sailor. See you here. Hello, Masila. I can see you, uh, but you're Great. still muted. Okay, good to have you on the show, Masila. Hello, Matt, your friend. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy that uh, it it worked. Actually, yes, I'm organizing like a, a studio on the go. That was the only possibility for me to join, but I just hope to be here. So yeah, let's let's say the technology will not conquer us today. No, no. Yeah, Martin. As I said to our audience, uh, thank you for so much. You do everything to join because I know that you're on a mission too. And you also want to make this happen on the air show. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with a short uh, video, short interview about our special guest today. And I just click on the video and hopefully it's working. You only have. So. Spermaceti oil is what they're after. The Russians use it for high heat resistant oil for machinery. And one of the things that they were building with spermaceti oil was intercontinental ballistic missiles to make a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me, we are insane. Your plane will carry four police officers armed with uh, machine guns, tear gas, uh, bombs, over. It's the police, then. Why are they after you? You only have... 
have vigilantes when there's an absence of law. I've got a statement here from our clients, so we're going to play that on the loudspeaker. Uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in violation of international conservation regulations. We're acting in accordance with the United Nations World Charter for Nature and implementing these regulations. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. Remove yourself from these waters immediately. Please uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in violation of international conservation regulations. We're acting in accordance with the United Nations. Target is We're passengers on spaceship Earth, and people are killing off the crew. But every time that there's an action, there's a reaction. The laws we try to get out of here and stop your pirate whaling operation. That whenever um, there is no law enforcement body with the jurisdiction to enforce uh, international regulations and laws, we're not going to stand idly by and watch these laws be broken just because no governments have the political will to do anything to stop it. So we've set ourselves up as that law enforcement body. If the ocean dies, we all die. Okay, okay, so how do I get the video back to finish it? I hope so with this one. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know how much sin, but I had absolutely goosebumps when I when I saw this video. I guess yeah, you saw the, it for the first time. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I saw it previously, but uh, to be honest, uh, it always strike me the first sentence about how uh, people are using the oil from these uh, beautiful creatures to make a weapon for mass destruction. It's really insane. It's really crazy. Absolutely. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring him on the stage. My hero, Captain Paul Watson, here on the offshore on USA Global TV and Radio. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Captain Paul Watson. It's really an honor, an absolute honor to have you here on the show because I absolutely love what you're doing. Actually, I follow you since many, many years with other foundation that you started uh, many, many years ago and, and you left it and, and you go to, to another direction. And was, as I said in the beginning, Paul, is what I really appreciate is a person who has a spine, a backbone on steel, you know, it's not turning to the left, turning to the right. When he's on a mission, he's on a mission, no matter what's going to happen. And I absolutely love this approach. Paul, can you please tell us a little bit before we start for our deals, a little bit about your background? Well, in 1972, I was the co-founder of the Greenpeace Foundation. And uh, I left Greenpeace in 1977 and established the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society which I ran for 45 years until just uh, recently when there was a hostile takeover of the organization I founded and, uh, and I was uh, dismissed. So, uh, you know, to continue to do what I've been doing for 45 years, I set up the Captain Paul Watson Foundation. Uh, I have been consistent for those last 50 years in, in pursuing the course that I've set back then and I continue to do, but the organizations that I was with and founded and set up uh, changed. They got sort of taken over by bureaucrats and uh, they wanted to change the direction to go in a different way and to not focus on the same things using the same strategies. And uh, But we have to carry on doing what we're doing because we fill a very important niche within the marine conservation movement. Uh, we're into direct action. We're into obstructing, harassing, and stopping illegal activities. We're not protesting. And so uh, we're going to continue to do just that. And, and, and that's what I absolutely love because, as I said, you, you know, you follow your mission, you're not protesting over this, you're not just praying, you're going to action, to really, really action, because action is all what matters in life, I strongly believe. Paul, when started your, your love about the ocean and, and, and your whales? Did that start in the early years as a kid, or how, how, how did it come up? I was raised in an eastern Canadian fishing village, but uh, what really started me on this road was uh, I spent a summer swimming with a family of beavers in uh, New Brunswick, and uh, every day I would go and play with these beavers, and uh, I was 10 years old, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and the next year when I went back uh, that summer, I couldn't find the beavers anywhere, and I found out that trappers had taken them all during the winter. 
And that made me really quite angry. So that, that winter, I began to walk the trap lines and free the animals from the traps and destroy the traps. And I guess I've been doing the same thing ever since. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. So, uh, 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 please, Masim. Yeah, so it looks like uh, that actually what you are doing comes from the very early um, memory, let's say, and your first reaction, like instinctive reaction, was just to do something about it immediately. So I assume you, you just by yourself was walking around and destroying those traps. I was doing it by myself, but uh, also uh, one of the things that uh, people cite is, I think Dixie Lee Ray, who was the former governor of Washington, she said, evidence of uh, Watson's insanity can be found that when he was 12, he shot a boy in the rear end with a BB gun who was about to kill a bird. Anybody who would shoot another boy to protect a bird has to be insane. And my answer to that was, in my town, every boy shot every other boy with a BB gun. I just happened to have a practical reason to shoot the boy that I did. <laughs> yeah so you are choosing so you are just using the same let's say resources but in another cause let's say right and uh so i've always felt that the most effective thing is to get out there and blockade harass intervene and shut down these illegal activities and as a result we've saved you know tens of thousands of whales and hundreds of thousands of seals and untold numbers of fish and sharks and other creatures And uh, it's a method that works. I call it um, uh, aggressive nonviolence. What that means is we're going to aggressively intervene, but we're not going to hurt anybody. And I've never caused a single injury to a single person in my entire career. When you say it, uh, an aggressive nonviolence, um, have you ever been threatened by, by death by somebody, by an organization or on, on, on a journey? Whatever happened in your life, uh, I, can, I, I think it could be quite dangerous what you're doing. Oh, it gets threatened all the time. We've been shot at, our ships have been rammed, and uh, there's been a lot of dangerous co confrontations. And, of course, get a lot of death threats, but I don't really take those seriously. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if you go into with this approach, you have to expect that there's going to be consequences and repercussions, and you have to be prepared to deal with those. How you can how you can prepare that? Man? I guess first of all, it's all about the mindset, not 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 to run away in fear and give up. How do you prepare yourself to? Well, you just have to focus on your objective and on the strategies that you're going to undertake, and have to make sure that you take the precautions to not injure anybody. Uh, you know, I never really get depressed or pessimistic about anything because I learned a lesson a long time ago, a very valuable lesson. I was a medic during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota by the American Indian Movement. And that, that was back in 1973. I was 22. And we were surrounded by U.S. government agents that were uh, shooting at us. And they, they killed two people. They wounded 46. And I went to Russell Means, who was the leader of the American Indian Movement. And I said, look, what are we doing here? We have no hope of winning. The odds against us are overwhelming. And uh, we, we simply can't win. And he looked at me and he told me something that I'll never forget. He said, well, we're not concerned about the odds against us. We're not concerned about winning or losing. We're here because it's the right thing to do and the right place to be and the right time to do it. Don't worry about the future. You focus on the present. What you do in the present will define what the future will be. That's where our power is, in the present. And uh, so we don't, I don't get depressed. I don't get pessimistic. We have to just focus on doing what we're doing. And it has, uh, has had some wonderful results. I just love what you said, Paul, because I, I'm also very interested. It's all about the present moment. So many people are looking back guilty or in shame or looking into the future with a lot of fear and uncertainty, but it's all about being in the present moment. Do what you have to do in the present moment because it has an amazing impact on the future, but staying in the present moment, absolutely. And then you, there's less fear. Absolutely. Right. And also, as an activist, you really, you know, there's no place for fear. Yeah. So, so you ever experience fear or anxiety or just a little worry? No, never. <laughs> 
So how is that? How how you are doing that? Just basically by like as because I want to understand. It's it's just uh, very interesting for me. How you, do you do it? Because I know a lot of people with a very strong purpose and mission, and they are committed. They are very hard working, but they always uh, consider negative consequences, and from time to time they feel like you said depressed or anxious or whatever. And they learned how to overcome those. bumps so what from what you say i understand that uh, you do not experience any low times in in these 40 40 years No, I never have. Like I said, we focus on the present and um, not worry about the past, not worry about the future. And uh, yeah, that works. You have to have a sort of a bit of a, an objective outlook. You know, when I'm in the middle of a confrontation, say with a, a Japanese whaling ship, uh, I'm totally focused on, on the tactics that I'm, I'm doing at that time. So again, there's no place for fear. There's no place for second guessing. Uh, and, and you find in that, those kind of situations that you make the, the right decisions without... you know, being panicked or stressed or anything. Uh, I think it's the best way to approach it. Uh, you know, you also have to accept that, uh, you know, everybody's going to die. And once you accept the fact that you're going to die, it doesn't really matter when. It's more important about how you live. And uh, so I don't really worry about that. And if you conquer the fear of death, if you're not afraid of dying, then you're not afraid of anything. You're not afraid of taking action. You're not afraid of public speaking. You're not afraid to, to express yourself. Uh, so there's a lot of liberation in not being uh, afraid of uh, of dying or anything else. That, that's absolutely true, Paul. I mean, we could see it the last two years or two and a half years. So many people have been afraid of dying and forgot to live. Yeah. <laughs> and so and so concerned. Maybe we can talk about this topic in the, the greater sense a little bit later. But let's stay in the present moment. And uh, as you said, you, you left Greenpeace. You left C, C. Shepard as, as a founder and co-founder. Because you're on your mission, let's stay in the present moment. What is your vision with the Paul Watson Foundation? Well, it's very simple to continue doing what I've been doing, which is to go out and intervene, to obstruct, to harass, and to uh, uh, implement my strategy of aggressive nonviolence. You know, we were never out to win popularity contests or make people happy. Uh, I used to describe <laughs> us uh, ourselves as the ladies of the night of the conservation movement, meaning that people agreed with us, but they didn't really want to be seen with us in the daytime because they thought that we were too controversial, too confrontational. Uh, so I have no problems with being controversial and confrontational. The problem with my organization, Sea Shepherd, is it got very big. And uh, then people became very comfortable, some with their jobs. And uh, then I became a bit of embarrassment. They actually said, well, you know, your past is a bit of embarrassment for us going forward and working with governments and corporations. I said, well, I'm not really interested in working with governments or corporations. And uh, so I was literally told that uh, I was no longer welcome in the organization that I uh, established. And I wasn't even allowed to use the logos that I designed because uh, the board of directors of the organization in the United States had uh, seized control of this. None of these people have any background in Sea Shepherd. They just maneuvered their way into that position. And uh, I was literally told in June of this last year, he says, well, you work for Sea Shepherd. You're an employee. You do what you're told. And I said, no, nah, it doesn't work that way. I, you know, I don't, I don't do anything for money. They actually offered me a lot of money just to be a, an impotent figurehead for the organization. But I wasn't interested in that at all. Um, you know, uh, I'm an activist. That's what I will continue to be. And we will continue to do exactly what we did. So I've never changed. I haven't changed, but the, uh, but Sea Shepherd, the organization I was working did change, but there is a caveat to that. Not Sea Shepherd is a movement. It's not just an organization. And, uh, many of those groups in that movement are supporting me. So I'm working very closely with Sea Shepherd in uh, France, the UK, Austria, uh, Brazil, and New Zealand. And uh, so we, we have a coalition and that puts us in opposition to the other Sea Shepherd groups, but there's nothing we can do about it. We're not going to go down that path, right? For instance, uh, right now, Sea Shepherd Global is working in partnership with African countries to stop uh, poaching a fish in their waters. And that's all well and good. But three of those countries, Benin and uh, Ghana and Liberia, are supporting Japan in their efforts to resurrect whaling. So they're actually a pro-whaling. And so yeah. I protested and said, how can we work with governments which are pro-whaling? And uh, the answer was, well, sometimes we have to make concessions. We have to compromise. 
And I said, no, I don't. I don't compromise with with countries that are for killing whales. So that's the difference. I love that, Paul. I love that. <laughs> that's what I said. You know, this 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 backbone from steel. There's no compromise. I yeah. absolutely love it. And I, I always see this. You know that um, I have my own uh, foundation with, with, together with my girlfriend. It's called Respect Mother Earth. And I always say I don't want to grow too too fast and too so because I want all the money goes to good stuff and not for any administration stuff for salaries or stuff like that. Because as you said, people get. Uh, convenient to get a job out of it and then it's all about raising money to, to, to keep the machine going and, 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 and the mission is lost. Uh, Paul, I want to focus a little bit more on, on the ocean because uh, two weeks ago we had uh, uh, an amazing Spanish girl here on the platform on the show uh, from Gravity Wave. What they do is they collect plastic not only on the surface but from the, from, from the ground of the sea with all these fishing nets tons and tons of fishing that's getting out of the sea and and recycle it and make drill water so let's focus a little bit on the, on the ocean why is the ocean so important for us as, as as the humankind and specifically why are the whales so important actually i, I saw a documentary a few weeks ago that a blue whale consumes about 43 kilos i guess, I guess it's about 80 pounds of microplastic every day what, what's going on uh, on, on the sur under the surface of the ocean well, the value of whales are such that, as you say, one blue whale also every day defecates about three tons of manure, and that floats upon the surface of the ocean. And that manure uh, has the essential uh, nutrients of magnesium, iron, and, uh, and, ni and nitrogen. And what that does is that provides a nutrient base for phytoplankton. Now, since 1950, we've seen a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. And phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. And the reality is this, if phytoplankton goes extinct, so do we. We do not live on this planet without phytoplankton. The whales, are in fact, and dolphins and seabirds and that, they're the farmers of the ocean. They're fertilizing those crops of phytoplankton. The phytoplankton feed the, the, the zooplankton, which in turn feeds the fish. And it's a, it's a beautiful system which supports life in the sea. Now, I like to look at it this way. If you imagine the, uh, the planet as a spaceship, which is what it is, we're this incredible spaceship on a, a voyage around the Milky Way galaxy, and every spaceship has a life support system. And that life support system provides us with everything we need, the air we breathe, the food we eat, regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system is run by a crew of engineers, and they keep everything running. We humans, we're not engineers, we're passengers. We're having a wonderful time amusing ourselves. But what we are doing is we're killing the engineers. We're murdering the engineers. And there's only so many engineers that you can kill before the system begins to fall apart. And the engineers are the bees and the worms and the fish and the bacterium and, and the trees and the phytoplankton. These are the engineers for Spaceship Earth. And we have to make sure that they're, they're protected. We do not live on this planet by ourselves. And uh, they're absolutely essential. You know, a few years ago, I was doing an interview. I was got called up by Brett Hume, his uh, reporter for the Fox News Network in the U.S. And he said, did you say that bees, trees, and fish are more important than people? And I said, yes, I said that. And he said, well, how could you say anything so outrageous? I said, well, because they're more important than people, because they can live here without us, but we cannot live here without them. That makes them ecologically far more important than we are. Absolutely. That's what I always say when I said respect Mother Earth. It's, it's, it's not that the, the Mother Earth doesn't need us. We need Mother Earth because when we are gone, Mother Earth will recover uh, sooner or later. It's all about that we have to respect it because we need them and not the other, not the other way around. Uh, absolutely. How, how bad is the situation? Because I, I, I really, I'm, I'm very into uh, environmental stuff, but we always have been trained in school that the Amazon, the jungle is the most important resource for oxygen, oxygen and not the plantons. And that's the first time I hear about that. Uh, how bad is the situation? Well, I think the situation is extremely bad. A 40% diminishment in phytoplankton since 1950 is a very... Uh, you know, was, was going to have a lot of consequences. On top of that, you have acidification, plastic pollution, noise pollution, chemical pollution, radiation pollution. You also have uh, climate change. All of those factors are, you know, are pointing to a very ominous future unless we can address that. Uh, one of the things which I'm really concerned about is the destruction of biodiversity in the ocean. 
we need that diversity. Like there are three basic laws of ecology. The first is the law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. The second is the law of interdependence. Every species within an ecosystem is dependent on every other species. And the third is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And one, oh, sorry. And when one species, uh, one, one species uh, uh, takes or steals the carrying capacity from other species, that causes diminishment in both diversity and uh, interdependence, which leads to ecological collapse. Absolutely. That's, I guess that's what we have to understand as a human being. That this is synergy. All all belongs together. And, you know, I'm, 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 from my background, I'm, I'm I'm a business consultant worldwide with my team. But I call myself as a entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur, a entrepreneur, bringing, giving, giving back. You know, this has all the giving and receiving. But I always say diversity is so important, and there is no ruler on this world. When when you go to a forest, you know, nobody says I'm the king here. I give the rule. It's it's all working in in, in synergetically in the environment, and and we as a human people, uh, human kind, we have to understand this and not to interfere too much. Uh, in, into this process because everything is rolling myself. I know that my, my friend Marcin here has a question on how everyone can contribute on a daily basis because that's about Marcin. Yes, that's that's what is interesting for me. But before that, I would love to ask because um, I understand these rules and they are very you know uh, accessible. Everybody can just learn about it, but. Um, I'm interested in your perspective. Why is that uh, most of the humanity is just ignoring the science, ignoring the facts, ignoring all of those, you know, interconnections? What is that about the human being that we are so easy to be, I don't know, misled or whatever? I guess you're, you're, you're muted, Paul. I think people like to find the easy way out and they go along with the flow and really don't think about things too much. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're molded and manipulated by the cultures that we live in. And, and, and nowadays that's a media culture. It tells us what to wear, tells us what to eat, tells us how to think, tells us how to behave. And unfortunately, too many people go, go along with that. And uh, more, less and less people are thinking for themselves these days. And that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we know that um, many people probably, and uh, to some extension, probably each of one, each and every one of us um, is sometimes just following without a question. So, what would you suggest uh, to like a regular guy or lady up there? What can he or she do? Uh, on a daily, ba daily basis in their environment, in their household, to support your cause uh, outside of money? Just what can we do outside of just uh, giving some money, for example? Well, the, str the strength of an ecosystem is in diversity. Therefore, the strength of any movement is in diversity. And it really comes down to people doing what they can do best. You, everybody should use their skills and their abilities and apply it to making this a, a better world to live in. And so whether that approach be education, litigation, legislation, or direct intervention, it all points to the same, uh, to the same result. We all have to be involved. And uh, so that's really all we have to do is to focus on what we do best. And, uh, you know, you can, you can change the world with a camera. You can change the world uh, with coming up with the new inventions. Uh, there's all sorts of ways you can do that. And it's really people deciding who, what they are and what they can do do best to achieve those results. Mm, I understand. So uh, uh, as I understood what you said is that actually we just have to be involved and then um, the way will come. So either it will be just, uh, I don't know, caring for the wastage that we are uh, making or just supporting some community or giving our competencies in order to support some kind of a movement. Uh, there could be a way for everybody to be involved, right? You, you muted, Paul. Sorry. sorry. Uh, yes, everybody has to find a way to be, uh, to be involved. And um, here's the thing, that one person can make a difference. Just look what Greta Thunberg has, uh, has accomplished. Uh, because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Because of David Wingate, we still have storm petrels in, in Bermuda. 
I mean, if one person concentrates on doing just one thing, that makes a significant difference. Each and every one of us has the ability uh, to change things. Uh, you know, one of my crew members back in 1979, he was only 18 years old. He said, we got to do something about the way they're treating animals in laboratories. And I said, well, this is Sea Shepherd. Uh, we're not going to do it. But if you're so passionate about it, why don't you do something about it? He said, well, what can I do? I said, well, use your imagination and come up with something. So he went to back to Maryland, got a job in a laboratory, uh, which was uh, experimenting on chimpanzees. Uh, there's a lot of abuse there. He documented it. He took that documentation after a year to the Washington Post and to TV stations, and he shut the place down. And from that, he then set up his own organization, which is the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. So that was one person who wanted to make a difference, and he did. Absolutely, it's, it's always it's always started with the first. It's always started with the first step, and, and 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 that's what I love on your example and, and other people out of the world. They just go on a mission. They just start. As you said, have an imagination what you can do, and just start again. There are so many talkers around. You know, people are talking and talking and talking in <laughs> politics, but there's not enough people who get into action. And that's all about this platform also here that we want to bring people here. If they're highly people know you like, like you, you're a famous person, you're here, or people who are less famous, just to bring them on stage on a platform and, and, and give them an example for other people to inspire them and start their own way of preserving uh, the planet, whatever it is, the forest, the sea, the lake, wh whatever it is. Uh, Paul, uh, I don't know, your, your time is very valuable. Um, I have a question about, everybody's talking about the Great Reset, what's going on behind the scenes. What are your thoughts about where is this society or the severe stuff going where are we floating I mean, because i know that you're a radical thinker and you're not uh like myself you're not you're not into the mainstream media you have you have your own ideas your own thoughts where are we going and how can we stop it well i don't think we're going to solve anything through politics i mean right now we're having uh cop 27 in egypt which i find a ridiculous because the Egyptian government is telling young people to speak truth to power. And this is in a country where 75,000 young people are in prison for speaking truth to power. And also we find COP27 is being sponsored by Coca-Cola, of all things. Uh, <laughs> nothing ever gets resolved. This 27 conferences without anything being resolved on that. So we have to stop depending upon these conferences or governments solving the problem. It's only going to be solved through direct intervention by individuals, you know, who, who make a difference. And uh, because no politician is going to make a change because it's political suicide. You try to do something about, uh, uh, about anything, it's going to cost jobs, it's going to make you unpopular, and you're going to be voted out of office. So the, I don't see the solution uh, through politics. I haven't seen any governments actually do anything that has directly addressed... Uh, you know, the issue of climate change, really. It's just a lot of talk. And, you know, I hear promises by 2030, we're going to do this. By 2050, we're going to do that. I want to hear we're doing it right now, but I don't see that happening. Uh, absolutely. We, we hear a lot, of, especially before election, we hear a lot of promises and, and then nothing nothing is done. And that's what I said. A lot of people are talking, but but there's still a lot of people outside. And, and when I'm on the street, especially talking to young people, what I don't understand is that especially young people like like my kids in their late 20s and 30s, they believe the screen move and the screen politics and they're doing nothing. I don't know how the situation is in the, in the US, but here in Europe, we have a lot of green partners involved in governments, but nothing... It's even going worse. We, are, we, we go in a war in the Ukraine. We do this, we do this. It's even worse. And, be, and, and young people st still believe the narrative of the green movement. It is not happening. There's no action here. Just nothing. Just well, nothing. It's, it's a vicious circle. I mean, for instance, uh, we didn't make any progress uh, on climate change because suddenly there's a war in the Ukraine. But the problem is, is that diminishing ecosystems are going to lead to more and more conflicts. And you're going to have resource uh, wars really that are going to happen throughout there. So with diminishment of resources comes more and more conflict. And then those conflicts then distract from actually solving the problem. Uh, people say to me, well, you know, we can't be concerned about, uh, about pollution. I mean, there's a war in Ukraine. We have to support the Ukrainians, that kind of thing. But it's just a vicious circle. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. but there's going to be more and more of these conflicts because of the fact that nobody's addressing the one main issue which is the destruction of this planet by climate change and pollution and overpopulation we're simply not addressing the real problems just this week they announced their, the planet's population has uh, reached eight billion 
Now, the year I was born, it was three billion. So it's jumped, uh, you know, that much in just one generation. Where's this going to? Where's this going to end? It's going to end with a collapse. So here's the two things that are going to happen. We either come up with a solution, we find a solution, or the solution will be taken care of by the, by the laws of nature. Now, when people tell me, well, you know, it's just seemingly impossible, how do, we, how do we address this? It's an impossible problem. Well, the solution to solving an impossible problem is to find the impossible answer. And how do we do that? Through imagination, through passion, and through courage. In 1972, the very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa was impossible. It was unthinkable. And yet the impossible became possible. And that's what I think that we have to strive for, making the impossible possible. And uh, that can be done. Uh, we just have to unleash our full potential, our imagination, our, our, uh, through courage and passion, and we can get it done. And mm -hmm. I see a lot of young people today who are actually driven to do things like this and getting involved in hands-on issues all over the world. You know, one of my officers, uh, she was concerned about refugees uh, coming out of North Africa. Instead of just talking about it, she went and got the artist Banksy to buy her a boat. And now she's off the north coast of Africa re rescuing refugees because that's what she wanted to do. She's making a difference. So, it's again, it's finding what you're passionate about and just doing everything you can to implement the, uh, you, you know, your skills to, to, make, uh, to change things. Absolutely. Paul, what, Paul, what do you think about... This this movement that's going on, we have it in Europe. I don't know in the US that young people for saving the planet are sticking themselves on in in museums on famous paintings. What do you think about this? Well, I think that uh, we again we live in a media culture, and therefore you got to get the attention of the media, and uh, so they're certainly getting that a, a, a attention, and. You know, you got to have to do outlandish things. I mean, we can't go to war. We can't pull out machine guns and throw bombs. I mean, that's not the way to do it. Our weapons are really cameras and uh, computers and, you know, and, and, and writing, really. That, those are the only weapons that we really have. And uh, so anything that's going to get a message across, even if it means doing outlandish uh, things like, gluing your hands to a painting or something that's going you know i used to teach at art center in pasadena california and one of the student one of the questions i used to ask the art students what is more valuable a work by van gogh or rembrandt or this species of sparrow this little bird what is more important and people would say well obviously you know the the paintings are more important they're more valuable i said yeah but in a hundred thousand years these paintings will be dust but the, the sparrows, they could survive. They could continue to be on. That's the real art. The real art in this world is the art of nature. There's where you get all your colors and your designs and all your magic is in nature. Uh, all of these man-made things are just an illusion, really, and uh, relatively meaningless. They, they have value because we give them value. You know, look at it this way. Imagine going into the city of Mecca and spitting on the black stone. Your chances of getting out of there alive are somewhat remote. Or walk into Jerusalem and take a pickaxe to the Wailing Wall and you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. An Israeli soldier will probably shoot you. And nobody's gonna have any sympathy for you because you attack something which is sacred. And yet each and every day we go into the most sacred, most beautiful cathedrals of the natural world, the rainforest of Amazonia or the Great Barrier Reef of Australia, and we totally desecrate these cathedrals. And what do we do about it? People jump up and down with picket signs or wear animal costumes and write letters or petitions, but they're not really as passionate about protecting that as they are about protecting some old meteorite in Mecca or an old wall in, in Jerusalem or a marble statue in Rome. This is where our priorities are. You know, a few years ago uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, a ranger shot and killed a poacher who was about to kill a black rhinoceros. And human rights groups around the world condemned this man. How dare you take a human life to protect an animal? And I think his answer really illustrated the hypocrisy of our society. He said, you know, if I was a police officer in Harare and a man ran out of Barclays Bank with a bag of money and I shot him dead on the street, you'd pin a medal on me and call me a hero. So how is it that a bag of paper has more value than the future heritage of Zimbabwe? This is where our, uh, you know, our problem lies, is our values are so warped. We don't value those things which are really important, the, those 
things that are in nature, which are there. Uh, we, we value those things that we make and uh, give value to. Absolutely, absolutely, Paul. I'm absolutely with you. I'm, I mean, I, my first studies was, was history when I went to university, after, and I was studying a religion because I, I I left my my cultural background to get out of it because I I don't I don't believe in a religion uh, that is uh, driven by fear, uh, like Christianity or Jewish or Islam. There's a lot of point. But what I what I what what I learned very early years that there was, there was a letter uh, written by Pope Alexander the Sixth many hundred years ago. It was writing that everyone who's not a Christian is not is not a human being. You can kill and whatever, and you can take whatever you want. And then all this colonization started. You know the ships went out from Spain and from Portugal, and killed indigenous and took all the stuff. And I guess that this was the I guess there they started the journey where there was a shift from from nature. To to to, right. to give value to things that we can control and we get attached to it. I actually established my own church, which is called the Church of Biocentrism, and it's to counter the anthropocentric uh, religions of the world. All world religions are anthropocentric. That means they're all revolve about us. We're important. We're the center of creation. We're everything. Biocentrism is more of an indigenous culture's uh, outlook, which means that we're part of everything. We're equal to everything else, that we depend upon each other. And that's the kind of uh, philosophical thing that we need to encourage, this understanding that we are interdependent, interdependent with all other species. You know, a few years ago at the University of Texas, a student said, we don't need other species. We've got, we've got uh, the internet, and we've got space travel, we've got all this technology. Why do we need other species? And I looked at him and I said, you know, when I'm looking at you, what do I see? Do I see an individual? He said, yes, I'm an individual. I said, no, you're not. I'm looking at a symbiont. There are about 1,700 species in and on your body right now of microflora, of, of, of bacterium. They not only are there, but they are responsible for your survival, for your existence. You could not live without them. They digest your food. They even groom your eyelashes. You know, they manufacture vitamins in your body. That just shows the interdependence of just those species living on and in your body. And uh, I mean, he just couldn't, it was like nobody had ever said anything like that him, to him before, but that is the truth. We do not live alone by ourselves. Humanity is not an island. Uh, we are interconnected with everything else. One of the reasons we're having so many problems with emerging diseases, zoonomic transmission of diseases, is because climate change and the diminishment of diversity is destroying ecosystems and diminishing the species. And that means that the viruses associated with those species have to go somewhere and they're coming to us because there's 8 billion of us. So we're pretty attractive. And uh, so the, over since 1995, you've seen the emergence of Hanta virus, Zika virus, West Nile virus, uh, COVID, all of these different things. And it's going to get worse. And on top of that, you have emerging pathogens coming from melting permafrost. For instance, in 2017, a thousand reindeers and a human being died from anthrax, which was le released from a, a thawed caribou car car carcass uh, or reindeer carcass. Sorry. And uh, so this is going to be more and more of a problem. So if people thought that wearing a mask because of COVID was a, an inconvenience, 10, 20 years ago, it's going to become pretty much a lifestyle because uh, there's going to be so many emerging viruses coming out as a result of what we're doing. Basically, we're living in a world where the ecological uh, system that supports us is in a state of collapse. And that's going to, uh, is not going to bode well for the future. Now, when people tell me, well, don't you feel depressed about that? I said, well, no, because I know one thing that all, of all five major extinction events in the history of this planet, they all had one thing in common. And that is after 18 to 20 million years, full recovery. So uh, 18 to 20 million years from now, this will be a beautiful planet. Once again, we might not be here, but it's going to be a beautiful planet. And that, so when people say we're trying to save the planet, nah, nobody's going to save the planet. The planet will save itself. This movement is about saving ourselves from ourselves. That's what it's all about. And uh, to do that, we have to save other species that we're depend upon for survival. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I guess this is a good ending for the show. We're coming to the end. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, can people get in contact with you, your organization? The best thing, I guess, is the website or how can they contribute to you, donate, or maybe they want to work with you together? How can they connect you? Uh, through uh, the www.paulwatsonfoundation.org. Uh, uh, org, that's uh, probably the best way. Yeah. Oh, also, okay. and I do have the have the Church of Biocentrism. You can look that up too. <laughs> okay, we will link it later when we do the recording on YouTube. Cool. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. 
thank you so much uh, for your time here. But thank you much, much more because it's not about us, what you do for this planet and what, what you do for the species. Thank you so, so much. And I hope you will stay healthy many, many more years that you can fight what it's wrong against what is wrong in or going on in this world and maybe we can have another discussion uh, about climate change and stuff like that i would highly appreciate it if your time allows it thank you oh. so much well thank you. thank you thank you bye paul bye bye oh Marcin. <laughs> that was something <laughs> Thank you, my dear friend, for, for joining me. Um, uh, yeah, it was uh, just an amazing to, to meet a person like Paul and and hear his story. And, 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 and you know, when, when, when fighting for, for something, against something, but st and seeing all the shit that's going on in the world and still staying so positive, that's, that's just a, an amazing role model, an amazing role model. That was a privilege, actually, to experience uh, that directly from from the guy. So yeah, I'm I'm very like moved right now, and I think I have a lot to think about. Thank you. Yeah, your, your final words before we close down, Marston. Uh, I wouldn't even try to spoil what uh, what's on the dead. So um, I'm I'm just hoping that more people would listen and reflect upon uh, the idea that stands behind his words. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, I guess there's nothing to say, but a lot to do. So I hopefully, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you're listening to us, watching us on a channel, on a podcast, on a radio station, on a TV station, on social media, when you get inspired, uh, yeah, go out, do something. I mean, the minimum thing you can do is support organizations like the Paul Watson or, or Foundation uh, and, and donate money. But I guess it's much more than just donating money. Get out and do whatever you can yeah, do. On, I would on say, I would say, based on, sorry, Roland, but based on what Paul Watson said, uh, I would say uh, more important thing to get to get involved, to learn more, at least, just to be interested in the topic, not just giving money, because as soon as you are giving money, you uh, are legitimate just to forget about it, because I've already paid. So I think what captain paul watson is suggesting is that uh, a little bit harder or even easier because you can uh, be involved for free you can just uh, donate your time your competencies your passion your energy your life so uh, i'm taking this as a lesson learned thank you thank you Marcel. okay let, let's end up here we are a little overdue thank you so much and we see each other again in two weeks on the earth show here on usa global tv and radio and thanks to the founder uh and president uh dr jacqueline kirby to give us this opportunity to spread this message about the planet about mother earth to the world thank you so much see you soon bye bye